Uh, today, I want to go to Psalms 137. Psalm 137. You may stand when you get the word. Psalms 137, 1 through 4. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hang our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, they that carried us away, captive, required of us a song. And they that wasted us required a myth, mirth, excuse me, saying, sing unto us one of those songs of Zion. Verse four, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? How can we sing in a strange land? Now let's go to Psalm 34, one through eight. Psalm 34, 1 through 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. And delivered me from all my fears. They looked upon him and were delighted. And their faces were ashamed. This poor man cried. And the Lord heard him. And saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped round about them. That fear him and deliver them. Deliver them. Oh taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. You may be seated. I take note in the first part of the scriptures that I read. In the fourth verse when he says, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange place? How can we actually praise the Lord with all this on us? How can I? actually get a praise through the way I'm feeling. You must keep in mind some of the history that was going on at the time. This particular verse was written or noted to the time about 550 years before Christ. It was when the children of Israel were in captivity down in Babylon. When the Babylonians came into Judah led by King Nebuchadnezzar, they tore the temple down and they tried to destroy Judah. In the process, they decided that we would take back some of the Jewish young men that were strong and healthy back to Babylon with us. And we would train them how to be not so much as slaves, but perfect servants for the king. We'll take the ones that we thought could learn and comprehend and, and learn how to serve royalty. While they were down in the Babylonian empire, they would sit out and just miss their home, miss. You know how it is when you haven't been to church for a while and, and you remember the songs of Zion. They sat out and they longed for what they used to have. It was some of those Babylonian Warriors that came to the young men and said, why don't you sing us some of those songs that y'all sing? And I might as well tell you that there's nothing like the saints singing. We don't sing like them. They may try to sing like us, but we don't sing like them. And they asked the young men, can you sing us some of those songs that make you feel like shaking your hands? Those songs that make you feel like patting your feet. The children of Israel down there in a lonely place. Ask the question. The young men asked. I know that was good worship. But how can we worship where we are now? 
I want to talk to somebody today. You're in a place that the enemy have you feeling like you can't get a breakthrough. Uh, they ask the question, how can we sing in this place that we are, we, where we're at? Today, I would like to use for a topic for the next few minutes, a true worshiper. For a subtopic, can you praise God in the wilderness? Can you praise God in the wilderness? It is my desire to help lead this church, our congregation, our community, our city into a place of worship that we've never been before. I know you worshipers, but I believe that every day with Jesus gets sweeter than the day before. So there's some more for us. It is my desire to get everybody to see how powerful true worship can be. In order for us to become a great worshiping church, we got to accept that worshiping is giving him honor greatly. Worshiping is expressing adoration for him. Worshiping is showing respect to God. You can't be a great worshiper if you don't respect God. Worshiping shows reverence to God. And true worship shows great praise to God. It's important for every one of us to realize that if I'm going to be a true worshiper, I got to find a reason to celebrate him. I got to find a reason to reflect on and highlight his goodness. And not only that, in order for me to be a true worshiper, I got to learn how to trust him. I got to let the world know that I trust him. And I got to let the world know that I live for him. My desire is that we as a church make these acts of worship some of our highest priorities. Understanding that worship does not just start when we get here. These acts of worship must be a lifestyle. Praise and the almighty God must be part of our everyday life. As a church, not only should we have a praise when we come in here, but we should have a praise at home. As a people of God, we should have praise and worship every day of our lives. We should praise God when things are going good. We should praise God when things are going bad. We should praise God when we're on the mountain. We should praise him when we're in the valley. We should praise him when we have good health, we should praise him when we have bad health. We worship God not so much of because of what he's doing, but because of who he is. The one thing about the children of Israel, while they were in the wilderness on their way to receive the promise that God had promised them, the problem that they had is that they refused to be true worshipers. Every time something went wrong, they subtracted the worship that they had for God. They cannot be consistent in their worship. Some of y'all know how it is. It's hard to worship God with a lot of weight on your back unless you're a true worshiper. If you're not a true worshiper, the enemy could cause you to not want to worship God. The problem with the children of Israel is they allowed the wilderness to become bigger than the promise. So many times problems come into our lives and darkness come into our lives and the devil will tell you, you don't feel like singing right now. You don't feel like honoring God right now. You don't feel like telling him he's all right right now. What the children of Israel did 
in the process of dishonoring God, they allow doubt to sit in their choir. They allow brother dishonor to be their worship leader. Every time something went wrong, they got mad with God. And I understand some people can't worship God because you don't know him. Part of worshiping God is getting to know God. So maybe he didn't open the door, for, but he's a door opener. Maybe he didn't give me what I asked, but he's a blesser. And because I know this, I must give him honor. The children of Israel, every time something went wrong, they begin to dishonor God. Let me ask you this. What's going on in your life? Is there something that makes you not get to the place where God wants you to be? Is there something that getting in the way of what God is trying to get you to do? Don't let your problems dictate your worship. Don't let your situations control your worship. As I said, they let Brother Doubt sit on the front row in the choir. You got to tell doubt to get out of the way. They let sister fear lead the worship. You got to tell fear you have no place here. Because I believe God. Somebody said the greatest praise you could give the Lord is hallelujah. I take it a little further than that. I believe just as great of a praise is the life you live. Because when people see that you trust your God, they're willing to inquire about your God. When people see that you don't trust your God, how do you expect them to listen to you? You don't even trust them. People come into your church and you don't even have a reason to clap your hands. You don't even have a reason to open your voice, open your mouth and use your voice. You don't even allow that what God is trying to bubble in your heart. I'm sure there's somebody would tell you, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, yeah. my soul cries out hallelujah. I praise him for saving me. Yeah. I think about even the children of Israel. Remember when they were out in the wilderness in Exodus 15, they begin to Complained to Moses about we don't have any water. They actually discontinued their, their worship. They couldn't worship God because they were thirsty. And Moses came back and God told him to get water out of the rock. But no, even before God did that, they should have understood that they serve. Jehovah Elohim, he's the creator of all. He created the water. It's not lost. Ask him to lead you to the rock. In Exodus 16, they were worshiping and they stopped their worship because they said, we don't have food to eat. Nobody said, well, we serve Jehovah Jireh. He's a provider. These are the children of Israel. That's our God. He will provide. He's not worried about what's on the shelf that Myers. God will provide for you. He's not worried about the cost of gas. God will provide for you. Don't let the situation stop you from giving God honor. It was in the 22nd chapter of Genesis that God told Abraham he was Jehovah Jireh. The children of Israel should have remembered that. When Abraham was up in the mountain with his boy, God said, I will provide for you. It was in Exodus 14. When they begin to complain again, we don't know which way to go. Pharaoh's behind us. The Red Sea is in front of us. When they knew that God was Jehovah Rohi, the shepherd, the shepherd will lead you, the sheep, anywhere where it wants to go, where it needs to go. 
It was in Numbers 13, the book of Numbers, that they got Moses in trouble. And did you know a lot of people don't understand why Moses didn't go into the promised land? God let him know in Numbers 19 and 20, you failed to give me glory. You failed to let your life worship me. It wasn't that he smote the rock. I mean, I'm sorry, it wasn't that he threw the Ten Commandments down. Because when they begin to complain again, the children of Israel came to the pastor and said, we don't have water again. Now, remember, God had already given them water and smote the rock and showed them, I can give you whatever you need. But they got thirsty again. The devil is trying to make you thirst to the point that you don't see what God can do for you. God had already showed them. When they complained to Moses and Aaron that we don't have water, we have needs. My point is, some folks can't worship God because of the needs. Some folks don't worship God because they're looking more at the need than they're looking at the giver. God is greater than your need. The devil can cause problems, but God is a greater problem solver. Yeah. And so they tell Moses, we're tired, we're thirsty. Moses and Aaron goes into the temple, fall prostrate, begin to pray. God speaks to Moses. He says, Moses, I want you to get up and show them all that I've shown you. Yes, I'm Jehovah Jireh. Yes, I'm Jehovah Nisi. Yes, I will raise a banner. Now get up and go reiterate what I am. He says, I want you to speak to the rock this time, Moses, and water will come out of the rock. Moses comes back out there and he's so frustrated by the people complaining. He's so frustrated and, and, and disregarded knows sometimes the burden of people telling you you're doing nothing right. You just spent all these years trying to do what God told you to do. The people told Moses, you just don't have it. Moses comes back out to the people and he says, he calls himself getting even with the people. And that's why you pray for us, Pastor. You pray for me because sometimes the enemy would tell you to get the last word. It's not about getting the last word. It's about giving God's word. It's not about having the final say. God has the final say. So Moses comes out and he tells the people, I'm tired of y'all. Do I have to bring the water to you? Don't you know God will provide? So Moses takes his staff and hit the rock. And water comes out of the rock. God immediately tells Moses that. I didn't tell you to do that, Moses. You failed to give me glory. You failed to worship me. And said, because of that, I'm not going to let you go to the promised land. Did you know that's why Moses couldn't go to the promised land? Because of that one event? God says, because you failed. Because if you had to did the right thing, you would have called folks to worship me. If you had to show them that I'm the God, the almighty God. Moses got upset. And that's why, you know what? Let me say this. I'm almost finished. I got one more story. You need to get away from people that's not worshipers. Because if you can't bring them up, they're going to bring you down. Huh? I don't hear nobody. If you can't bring them up to you, they'll bring you down to them. Moses comes back out and he's tired of people complaining. He's tired of people saying what God didn't do. Tell me what God did do. The enemy will have you feeling like. Nobody loves you. The enemy will have you feeling like God can't do it. The enemy will have you feeling like God's not going to do it. You have to tell the devil that he's a liar. God is for me. Yeah. Moses come back out in the people. The people that's not worshiping are louder than the voice of God. And Moses get upset. And God told him just to speak. That's powerful. God tells you just to speak the thing. How many of you sitting here, God have told you to speak to your family, speak to your neighbor, speak over your neighborhood. But we said, no, because of the way they act. Uh -huh. 
Sometimes even speak to your brother, your sister. Am I my brother's keeper? Maybe. Maybe. But because of the way they are acting, I don't have a word to say. I tell y'all my testimony all the time. Sometimes it's not even because of the way they're acting. Sometimes it's because of the way you're acting. I tell my testimony all the time how I was in the doctor's office, make a long story short, and, 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 he, and he was upset with me because I wasn't listening to him. And then God speaks to me when the doctor tells me he has to go in for an operation. God tells me and said, pray for your doctor. What? <laughs> Speak over my doctor's life? And I don't even, and y'all know something, he up until about a few years ago, District Elder, he would give me the prescriptions and I would throw them out of the window on the way home. I was a hard-headed, ignorant fella. I, I, you know, God has to help us. But I was like, I don't need this blood pressure medicine. And when I got about 60, I said, maybe he's right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> where's that red pill? But he knew that I was throwing the pills out of the window because he started tricking me. He would give me a 30-day supply, but schedule me back for 60 days. So I'll come back in 60 days. He said, did you take your medicine? And I'll beat around the bush. Well, you gave it to me. Did he said, you didn't have enough. So what did you take for the past 30 days? I said, look, I said, oh, that's right. He only gave me 30 pills. So he was testing me. But and so while I'm sitting in there, God tells me, he tells me I need to see you back. But God tells me when the doctor says, but I can't see you on March the 4th because I'm having an operation. God says, ask him, can you pray for him? I'm like, I can't pray for him because he knows I don't listen to him. I'm hard headed. And I only gave that testimony to say this, people. God used you because you're his child, not because you're his best child. You're saved not because you're so perfect, but because God loved you and called you into this thing. You're not saved because you make all the right decisions. You're saved because God chose you. The only reason you are here today is because God wanted you here. It's not because you had gas in the car. It's not because you got money in the bank. It's not because you think so fast, but the Holy Ghost power drew you here so you could worship God. And I, I'm almost finished, but let me tell you this. Sometimes the situations that we get in, the troubles that we have, is God drawing us out to the wilderness because he told Moses, Take the children out to the wilderness so they can worship me. Sometimes God will let you get in a situation because it puts you closer to worship. Don't you know you were made for worship? Don't you know you're God's child? God will not repent. I'm going to finish up with this story. Let's go to. Uh, let's go to Acts of the Apostles. Then I'm going to finish. Acts 16. And the simple thing today is if we can get to the place where it doesn't matter who likes me, I worship God. It doesn't matter who dislikes me, I worship God. It doesn't matter how much money I have, I worship God. It doesn't matter if you don't think I'm as good as you, I worship God. When God becomes the center of our attention, you will see some powerful things. The high places will come down. You will see some healing in your life, direction in your life, power in your life, provision in your life, prosperity in your life. It is all connected to worship. And so Acts, the 16th chapter, uh, can you read that for me? It could be one or it could be all. Starting, at, with verse 16. starting with verse 16. And I'm going I'm to explain this to you and then we're going to close out. Let me, let, me, let me explain that. When Paul got into the little Roman colony, Paul and Silas, uh, finishing up his uh, trip in that area, he got there and there was a little fortune-telling girl, a girl that made money by telling futures. You, you know those things that you all call the 1-900 number they tell you about? That was kind of a trick question. Nobody should even look up and say, yes, I know what you're talking about, Pat. <laughs> because if you are calling it, you, you shouldn't. 
But it was a little girl there that could tell people's future. She was making big money. She could actually go to, you know, walk up and say, Silas, your birthday is next week. You're like, how did you know that? She said, that'll be $10. You know, uh. she was giving folks their future. You're going to get a job. And, you know, we like that. Instead of hearing the word of God, that's why people like to go to revivals where the preacher saying, 10 people in here are going to get $1,000. Uh, Sister Janet, can I pray for you? I see, I see. Do your name start with a H? No, a J. Yes, yeah, close to the H. Yes. Uh, 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 you know, we, we like going to those things where people just take advantage of us and take our money because they say things we want to hear. But aren't you glad in worship? It may not always be what I want to hear, but God is real. He was real yesterday. He's real today and he'll be real tomorrow. And so she, she, she's tricking people and she's walking around. And, and so now she, the thing about the, 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 that spirit, that soothsaying spirit, she saw things that were true. When, when Paul and, and Silas got in town, she saw that these are men of God. So you know how the devil will try to show up in your church. The devil will try to get, be part of what's going on just to get his foot in. And, and so she, she, she actually started following the men of God around, telling everybody, these are the men of God. These are the people that God sent us. So everybody was like, wow, little Sally must know something. They're trying to tell you the way of salvation. And each day Paul would come out to witness and tell, and she followed them around, Paul and Silas, every day. Good name, yeah, the real Silas in the Bible, the other Silas. Uh -huh. uh, uh, she followed Paul and Silas around and, and, and kept, and Paul got upset with her. Paul, Paul got tired of, you know, the devil don't have to preach for me. The devil don't have to testify for me. I know God. You know, the devil doesn't have to, you know. So, Paul, what happened? So Paul got, got Paul and Silas, they kind of got upset. Uh, 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 uh. Can, I, can I use you for a second, little Silas? I'm not, I'm not gonna, come on, I'm not going to embarrass you. Just, Silas is the preacher. He's, he's just, I'm going to follow you. Y'all pretend I'm the suicide. Silas is preaching the word. And I'm like, oh, he's a man of God. Look at his blonde hair. Oh, he's a nice looking little man of God. And she was telling the truth, but she was doing it for her own purpose. And he walked down here, I'm just going to follow. Oh, this is the guy. He, he knows, he knows. He gets straight. He goes, and she's following. And so Paul finally said, you know what? I'm tired of the devil. It's going to stop. Sil Paul and Silas says, we're getting tired of the devil trying to take God's credit. So Paul turns around and what he, he says, in the name of Jesus, yes. come out of this woman. In other words, shut up. I didn't had enough. It's over. So he cast, oh, you can sit down, sorry. they cast the, the, the spirit out of this woman. Now, because they cast the spirit out of this woman, somebody's going to lose some money. Because remember, she had that 1-900 number where she was giving people's fortunes and all that. Okay, we got to shut the 1-900 number down. And so, so her boss, the, the ones that were making money off this little lady, they got upset. Go, go ahead and tell her. Okay, let, let, let me say something because it's very important. We almost finished here. When they found out that, because when their spirit left her, she could no longer see the future. So, so let me tell you something. Sometimes false prophets will come and they'll tell the truth. They'll come to the revival and they'll say something. And, and, and if you're not a worshiper, you'll think, oh, they got to be of God because they told me, you, you know, uh, 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 I have a black car out in the parking lot. And my car is dark at night. It looks black. So they must know what they're talking about. In other words, they'll take advantage of your mind. And, and sometimes they'll get it right. Like, like you know, uh, uh, sometimes they just play with your mind. Like, um, you, you, you know what I, I, I heard? It was a, um, a guy on television. And I can't think of his name. It was a guy. He, uh, and this actually happened a few years ago. He, they would have you fill out a little card in the doorway. <laughs> Uh, what you want prayer for, what your, what your name is. So you're Sister Joyce, and could you pray for my knee and all this, and you put it on the card. And so when he comes out, his wife was sitting out in the audience with the cards, and they had put a, a fake microphone in his ear. Yeah, this is a true story. Uh, it was on 60 Minutes. They, they, they caught the scammer. And so his wife would tell him, 
uh, there's a sister Joyce Myers, the sister Joyce Mitchell in the audience, and she needs prayer for her knee. And so the, the, the preacher will get up and say, Holy Spirit, come. Is there a Joyce in here? She's like, oh, yeah. Just like it won the lottery. My name been called. He says, get up. I think you need, oh, I feel something in my knee. His wife is telling him in the microphone with the, what's on the car. And, and, and he would call her down and pray and then ask her for a big offering. Well, 60 Minutes sent a spy up in the church with a closed circuit radio that was hearing the same things that he was hearing. And they picked up that the preacher was actually doing that. The only reason I stopped to give you that is saints don't get carried away with foolishness. We need true worship in our church. We need true worship. It's not about how pretty the things sound. It's not about how wealthy the church look, how pretty the parking lot look. It's about if God is in here. Because you can have everything you need, but if God is not in this church, we've lost it, baby. We might as well lock the door. If God doesn't come to church with us, we might as well lock the doors. There's not the glory of God here. It doesn't matter how well we sing. It doesn't matter how well we preach. It doesn't matter how pretty this church is. If God is not here, we have nothing. But to make a long story short, they turned around and they rebuked this lady and they got mad. So they took Paul and Silas to the law and they made a mistake. They thought Paul and Silas weren't Roman citizens. But remember, Paul and Silas were Roman citizens and Jewish. Under the Roman tradition and custom, you couldn't arrest a Roman citizen in a Roman colony and beat him up. But they made a mistake. So they, they took and, and but Paul just kept his peace because Paul knew that I don't fight my own battles. So I don't have to pause, but they took them to the market and beat them and beat, said beat them till they were bruised and blue and everything and then threw them in jail. Go, go ahead. Verse 21, uh, they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. Verse 22, and the multitude rose up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. 23, and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safe. Who, having received such charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. So not only did they beat them, they threw them in the inner prison, not the first jail. So they, they took them down to the dungeon and put chains around their legs. And what happened? And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. Well, they, they, oh, say that again. They did what? They prayed and sang praises. Unto God. So they sung even though they were right. being beat. They still had a song? Yes. Even though they were thrown in jail, lied on, they still had a song? Yes. Even though they were mistreated, abused, misused, busted, disgusted, they still had a song? Yes. They still. How many of us come to church knowing that we've been done wrong? I admire people like that. I admire knowing that it was hard for me to get it, but I came because of God. I came because of God. And, 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 right. and what happened? And the prisoners heard them. Heard, the prisoners heard them singing. When you praise God, folks going to see it. Yes. They know that you've been done wrong. And you get up and praise God. People are going to, that's a testimony. Go, go ahead. 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. I, I, I'm going to stop there. The rest of the story is they went home and they went to the jailer's house and they got the jailer saved. It all because they were worshiping that night. They were praising God. So my thought is I'm trying to tell you, you don't have to wait till the chains get loose to give God a song. Give him a song now. You don't have to wait till you get healed to praise him. Praise him now. You don't have to wait till people do you right. Praise him now. You don't have to wait till you get money in the bank. Praise him now. If you give God a praise, God will remember that. God bless you. It is a good thing to praise the Lord. It is a good thing to praise the Lord. And when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. hallelujah, praise God for saving me, amen. When you're having, 
When you're up on the, on the mountaintop, it's easy to praise the Lord. But the same God that blesses you on the mountaintop is the same God that is with you down in the valley. Amen. And if you're going to be able to escape, amen, the valley situation, you're going to have to praise the Lord. Amen. And that's not a negative. That's a positive. Amen. When you think of the goodness of Jesus, amen, that's a positive. Amen. No matter what the situation is, when you think of the goodness of Jesus, amen, amen. Hallelujah. Let us stand. Thank you, Jesus. Certainly appreciate everybody out today. Amen. God has blessed us. Amen. We are blessed. I, I'm blessed to come here today. Amen. If you're here, you're blessed. Amen. God is with us. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Father in heaven, we're so thankful indeed for another service, another time together, another day that you blessed us with. Oh, Lord Jesus, that you are guiding us, you are keeping us, you're saving us. Oh, Lord, you're providing for us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You're everything. You're everything. Amen to us today. And we thank and praise you, oh God. We pray that you'll bless. Bless each one that leaves here today with a hand of safety as we travel to our homes. Lord, throughout the week, Lord, just continue on a daily basis. Continue to bless and guide us and keep us, oh Lord, until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.